everybody, welcome to CityLine Online. We're so glad that you're here hanging out with us. If today is your first day, you can expect to hear some amazing worship, some engaging teaching, and also about some next steps about how you can get involved and a little bit about the life of church here at CityLine. As always, there's multiple ways to connect. There's Facebook Live, there's YouTube, and the CityLine app. And then there's my personal favorite, there's our live outdoor service every Sunday at 10 a.m. on the front lawn. We'd love to see you there, but you need to register and bring your lawn chair. Let's enjoy the service right now. Hey, City Line. We're glad you're joining us in our time of worship. We invite you to stand from wherever you're watching, and let's get ready to worship him. I 
Hey church, so grateful that you are joining us on this online experience. And we wanna encourage you that we don't want you to join alone. We want you to take a moment to invite your friends, invite your family, send them a text, maybe just tag them, let them know that we are live right now and that you would love to invite them to church today. I'm guessing they'll be glad for the invitation. As we continue to worship God together today, one of the ways that we do that is through giving. We love giving back to God. It's a way that we choose to put God first in our lives. The City Line Church, we wanna thank you for your ongoing generosity. Because of your generosity, it enables us the opportunity to do ministry here at the local church as well as in our surrounding communities and beyond. So let's continue to worship God together.
Leadership is important. That's why here at CityLine, we strive to continually equip one another to love well and lead well in every domain. So if you want to grow as a business owner, coach, mentor, uh, employee, employer, or just continue to develop your leadership skills in general, we want to invite you to our 2021 CityLine Leadership College Preview Night on Monday, March 22nd at 6.30 p.m. To sign up, just visit citylineonline.org slash leadership college and take your first step and your next steps in growing and developing as a leader. We hope to see you there. Hey CityLine families, we are so excited to be having child dedications on March 28th at our live outdoor service. If you are interested in dedicating your child, please email kgrac at citylineonline.org. In just a few short weeks, we're gonna be celebrating Easter CityLine style. On Good Friday, you can join us for an online service only at 7 p.m. Join us via Facebook Live, YouTube, or the CityLine app. On Easter Sunday, invite the friends and family and come join us live at 9 or 11 a.m. You can also join us online at those same times. There ain't no party like a City Line party, because a City Line party don't stop. You're not going to want to miss this. Hey, Alan, you busy? Well, sort of. I mean, well, I guess not. You, got, you might want to put that away. You got some pretty heavy news. Yeah, so I, I just got home with the doctors, and what they're saying is that it's inoperable, completely inoperable. It's, it's exactly. Okay guys, I, I really shouldn't have to do this, but after that total debacle at Aunt Edna's funeral, I feel like I really have to. So as the emotional response team, we need to work together and figure out what we're gonna do. Do we really even need to respond? Okay, agreed. And as always, the best response is no response. You know what, you guys, you guys are all useless and you, you would say that. Hey guys, I got it. To ease the tension, I could I could tell a few jokes. And you know, I've been I've been working on some new material. You guys ready for this? Huh? Not a chance. And honestly, after that eulogy you gave at Aunt Edna's funeral, you're lucky to even be here at all. I say we just stare. And when has that ever been helpful at all? The bird, uh, how about no? Come on, the bird is the word. Zero, I mean, zero percent helpful. Zero, zip, zero. Okay, okay guys, here it is. How do you make holy water? Anybody, anybody? You, you're the worst. Why, why are you even here? Come on, come on, focus. We need to respond. Uh, well, maybe until we figure this out, we should just go into the garage and, and work on some stuff. Okay, okay, fine. I mean, at this point, that's the best we got. Any objections? Sounds good. That's a great idea. And when we're in there, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick a tire and, and break some stuff. You boil the hell out of it. See what I did there? See what I did there? Whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. We haven't needed you since we struck out in T-ball, okay? And we're never gonna forget what happened when you showed up in junior high. So nope, we voted, you're off the team, all right? Stay away. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to CityLine Online. We are thrilled to have you being a part of today's online experience. And if you're new and you're hanging out with us for the first time, man, we hope that it's not your last time. Uh, my name is Jack. I get to be one of the pastors here, and uh, we're just honored to have you on this feed with us. Today is going to be an incredible day. I'm telling you right now, we're going to have some fun because I have some people joining me today to help me teach. That's right. We're going into part five of a series of conversations that we've been in over the last few weeks that we're calling In My Feelings. And In My Feelings is a significant conversation because we're going below the surface, right? We're not staying surface level and just kind of touching nice, neat little things. We're going below the surface and we're addressing the areas of hurt, of pain. Uh, we're addressing the areas that we're all in our feels and we just really don't know what to do with that because we're addressing the question is what does it look like to pursue health and wholeness in Christ or to continue this journey of emotionally healthy 
spirituality, right? We understand that spiritual health and emotional health, they're connected. They're not separated. They're not disconnected. We can't live fragmented lives. When we do, it ends up in a very toxic situation. And so what we're trying to do today is we're trying to continue to hone in on the point that it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And to help me today, we've got some familiar faces that you might know uh, around the panel today. This is Suzette Magana. You guys know Pastor Troy, Pastor Soy, and Pastor Caleb all in the house. And so we're excited to be talking to you about something that we think is significant today. I mean, it's significant to our relationship with God. It's significant to our spiritual and emotional health. And what we want to lean into today is the understanding a bit more about loss and grief, right? We're talking through loss and grief. It's critical in our journey with Jesus. More importantly, what we want to talk about is how do you and I allow God to enlarge our soul through grief and loss? Through the pain, through the hurt, through the struggle, how do we allow God to continue to grow us, to, to move in us, to again, to lead us towards wholeness that can only be found in Jesus as we acknowledge the things that are going on in our life? I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, but loss, loss is really a, a fundamental issue that we have to deal with all throughout our life. Uh, essentially, from the time that we're born to the time that we no longer exist, we go through lots of little losses. It's as if life is all about loss. And if there's anything that we know about in the last year, both collectively, right, and individually, is that we know what it's like to experience loss, uh, the missing out of things that, uh, that used to be. You know, it's the, the grief associated with the pandemic, whether it be a, a loss of a loved one or whether it be a loss of lots of little things. Like you remember, you used to be able to go sit in a restaurant together with no mask and enjoy food with friends, or maybe you were able to go grocery shopping without the fear of being crowded in an aisle with no escape and air to breathe of your own, you know, or, or, or maybe you, you just, your kids are, are grieving over the loss of, they, they, they really loved going to school, honestly, as much as they told you that they didn't, they, they really miss it, right? And, and so, so now they're experiencing that loss. In fact, here, here's what I want to challenge you to do as we kind of engage our time together today. Would you just think about maybe two specific areas in your life or two specific times, maybe stories of maybe sorrow or loss or of tragedy that has directly impacted your life? Just think about it for a few seconds and, and do us a favor. Just write those things down. I, I know you could probably pick more. Some of you could write a book about loss and, and, and all the things that you've experienced. But let's just try to focus in on the two most significant ones that seem to have directly impacted your life. And here's why I, I want you to focus in on that. And it's kind of the premise of where we're going today. It's that I think part of the problem that you and I encounter often is that our culture routinely interprets losses as alien invasions that just tend to interrupt our quote unquote normal lives right? They're alien invasions. They come out of nowhere, right? Like the, the pandemic just showed up one day. You know, one day we were living life as normal. The next day we were being locked down, right? I mean, it just seems to, to show up. We, we, we don't invite it. We don't want it, right? But what it does is it takes us far away from what we've experienced as normal or the things that we've become accustomed to. And we have a really difficult time when we go through loss especially if we're not willing to lean into the process of grieving those losses, where all we want to do is fight to go back towards normalcy, right? I, I think if we've learned anything, like I said, in our time together over the last year, everybody's fighting as hard as we can to go back to what was normal. Let me ask the question, what if we never go back to normal? Well, what do you do then? You have to choose to acknowledge the loss, and choose to engage the process of grief. In fact, we all have losses of all different kinds. We should just acknowledge some of the early ones up front, and maybe you have all experienced this as well, right? There is uh, the idea that we lose our youthfulness, right? Anybody, anybody aging on the panel? Yeah, yeah, aging, aging on the panel. You know what I'm saying? I mean, th th those those things happen, right? Uh, and no amount of plastic surgery or cosmetics, right? You know, uh, no good diet. I heard you guys talking about, you know, like Herbalife. I heard you guys talking about the gym. I heard you guys talking about all kinds of stuff. I mean, none of that. I mean, it could slow things down and help us, right? You know, but but it's not going to stop the fact that we are going to get older. And it's not just youthfulness. Um, sometimes we lose a dream, right? Anybody ever lost a dream? Right? You, you know, it's like to, to, to lose out on, on this dream where you have to come to grips with, you know, you know maybe the career that you always dreamed of, it, 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 you're not, you're not going to make it, right? Or, or, or maybe an adventure that you always wanted to have, or maybe your, your, your dreams and goals of, of what perfect marriage looks like, or, or certain hopes that you have, like, like we, we lose those things. 
In fact, some researchers, some researchers would say that, that some of the greatest challenges that you and I have as we continue to grow older is at some point in the middle of our lives, like that midlife era, right? We're going to get to a point where you're going to have to grieve the dreams that you now know will never happen, right? It's intense. And not only that, but some of us, we, we lose our routines and stability. Again, a, a, a collective corporate experience that we're all going through right now where our routines have been flipped and turned upside down. We used to have a very clear cut approach to how we do life and now everything's been turned on its head. We're trying to find the center of our being. We're trying to restore some kind of normalcy. But then stability, right, is off, right? Sometimes if you lose a job or change a job or if you have to move out of your house to a new place or, or if, you, if you leave a church because of an issue or frustration or whatever, it is, you, there's this, this, this instability that seems to kind of take place, right? It happens in parents as our kids get older, right? And, and we, don't, we don't know how to deal with the fact that they're more independent now and, and, and everything just seems off. So we know what loss is, whether or not we acknowledge it or not is another story talk to you guys a little bit about loss and would love for you guys to share a little bit more about maybe some of the losses that you've experienced in your life that you think really have directly impacted you and 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 the way that you kind of kind of see their lens that you see life in fact you know, Caleb why don't you start us out today about lead off go to the youth department here we go you know, to help uh, us out. yeah I think reflecting there's been a lot of loss lost in my life um but i think one of the biggest ones was when my parents got divorced when i was a kid uh, i was around 14 or 15 so i was going into high school and i was grieving what my family was um, the unity that we had always had even though there's an aspect of dysfunction there um, that we would never collectively be a family again and, and work through that and, and understood that it would never look like that again um, up until that day, it wouldn't be the same. And so I grieved um, that aspect of family together. Uh, I think another one for me is um, when I was in college, uh, I had to grieve an injury. Uh, my freshman year of college, I played volleyball um, at CBU and I was, um, yeah, rising up on the team. And then all of a sudden I, I sprained my ankle super bad and um, I was sidelined for a long time and I had to grieve being stuck on the side. Uh, and what made that heavier is when I was in high school, I was always the best player on the team. Um, I went to a small private school. Um, and then when I went to college, I was just an average person on the team. <laughs> right. I went up another level and I had to be humbled a little bit, um, which was really good. But me going through that injury was showing that I couldn't be where I wanted to be because I thought I was getting better to be at the level that everybody else was. Uh, but that injury set me back and I had to grieve working through um, what was inside of me that I wasn't as good as everybody yet. And I couldn't be there in the timeline that I wanted um, to be at the point that they were uh, and that I was just another person on the team. And so there was a lot of grieving and working through all of that, of understanding that it was different than what I expected. I expected I was going to come onto the team and just destroy it. And right, right. I didn't do that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, and then when I started getting better, I was then set back and I had to grieve that process of being stuck on the sideline while my teammates were playing. Um, and I felt like I was just wasting time, but my body physically wouldn't let me play. Yeah. Um, and so I had to grieve that aspect too. So good. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Who else have experienced some, some grief? We'll go down the line. We'll just, okay, we'll, we'll go right down the line here. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Caleb. Uh, for myself, I would say um, something you guys are familiar with and uh, something that I've shared in 2017, May 12, 2017, I, I lost my mom uh, to cancer. Um, and it was a uh, very... Uh, unexpected, uh, a very tough thing to deal with for me and my family. Um, she was experiencing some pain, um, went in to, to get a checkup, they found some growths, ended up scheduling a surgery for a hysterectomy. Um, surgery went well, um, and then within a matter of days, she was experiencing some complications uh, from the surgery. And within a matter of weeks, she had slipped into a coma and we had lost her. And so, yeah, it was uh, very unexpected, very tough. And I would say to date is one of the most difficult things that myself and I, I think my family have I've ever faced, and um, you're never prepared prepared to do to nah. to deal with something like the loss of a of a loved one. So, um, yeah, just real quickly that one, and I would say the second one is something that just happened recently. We talked about uh, the great year that 2020 was, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the challenges that we all uh, face. But myself, like many other people, um, I was laid off from a job I had for uh, almost 13 years. 
Mm -hmm. um, something I was familiar with, something I loved doing, something that um, helped provide for my family and helped us accomplish some financial goals that we wanted to accomplish. Um, just like that, you know, it was a, a let go. And so that's been an adjustment and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Yeah. Um, so yeah, off the top of my head, those two things probably um, are, are, yeah, the, the things that I've been dealing with as far as grief and loss are concerned. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, um, uh, similar to, to, to Soy, um, when, I was, when I was 14, uh, my mother passed away. And I think uh, that, that has been like a huge um, just loss in my life. Uh, it's been a long time. But um, one of the things that, I, that I'm always reminded of is I was a drastically different person before that than I am now. Uh, kind of going through that loss and, and being able to grieve that has actually helped me to lean more into who God has made me to be and what he called me to. Um, so even though it's been painful and it's been been hard, um, it was an invitation to kind of course correct for me. Um, I was I was not in a healthy place um, when I was a young teenager uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, God, I, I really felt came close to me in that moment of sorrow and helped me kind of move in a better direction. Uh, and then um, one that I think <laughs> I laugh at um, because I'm not a person that typically does this, but I, I lost a five year plan. <laughs> not like I lost a paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I was about 25, uh, I, was, I was serving in, in the church in ministry. Um, it was something that I was very passionate about, something that I felt strongly about. I'd walked away from some opportunities um, in the, the corporate world, so to speak, and leaned into what I felt God was calling me to do. And I was asked the question like, hey, in ministry, where do you see yourself in five years? And I prayed about it. I really felt God speaking to me and, and I had this whole thing lined out. Um, and then <laughs> within a few months of that, everything in that particular season of my life just kind of blew up in my face. Mm. Um, and that was hard. I was, was a lot of anger um, at God. It's like, hey, I gave up this and then you bring me here and it's all taken away. Yeah. Uh, so having to, to grieve that and, and kind of deal with that and process that um, has, been, has been a journey. Um, you know, it's only been <laughs> what, like, eight years ago. So, right. you know, still kind of working through a lot of that. And um, thankfully, uh, God has provided some opportunities to, to to change it like that. My life looks nothing like what I thought it would look like. So, yeah, I think that's fascinating that you say that. I know we're going to get to that right now, but I think sometimes we have to remember um, when we're experiencing losses, um, sometimes they still feel very fresh. Mm -hmm. e even if, like you said, you know, at 14, I lost my mom, but then just about eight years ago, you know, th there's this other experience that I had. And so it doesn't matter if it was a year ago, six months ago, six years ago, you know, 10 years, it's like when loss happens, it, it hits us in a way mm -hmm. that you, you, it sticks with you, mm -hmm. right? It has an impact. How have you been impacted? You know, I have some, something to say after you say something, so I'm going to just stick to the script. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so Jack inspires my brain. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I, um, I feel like it's an ongoing loss, I guess. My husband and I have, um, not been able to have any kids and we're he's in his late 40s but I'm just 40 you guys very young <laughs> and so there's a transition of um of going from like a time when you're trying to have kids to a time where you're not and you just don't have any you know and um and so that's something that we have been going through for the last probably eight years I think we tried nine years because it's yeah. 2021 um and had a few pregnancy losses along the way. And um, so for us, it's it's a past loss thing, but more so for me, it's more of a future thing. So, and that was what I was gonna respond to, is the loss that we feel, especially when it's like our moms, is not just a loss of what we had with her, but like her being in our lives for the rest of our lives. And so there's an ongoing loss, I think, that can happen as we grieve, which is normal, especially when it's your mama. You know? Totally. Um, so um, for, for me, it's an ongoing loss of like what I wanted my life to be and what I wanted it to look like and um, trying to feel all of that and also trying to accept it in a way where I'm living into what he's given me, which is so much, you know. So um, and I have to say it's more of a future loss for us. It's more of like, oh, I really wanted to have kids that were grown and grandkids. I'm kind of cool right now, just sleeping <laughs> in and running a business. Yeah. And my husband and I are very well rested. And yeah, we have a very beautiful life. Un unlike day Troy. to day. Right. Yeah, nobody. Yeah, trying to call out Troy. So, right you know, <laughs> just so you know. Yeah. And that's a comfort. 
<laughs> yeah, it's so good. How well rested I am. No, yeah. actually, actually, I'm not because I have a new puppy. Yeah. So I'm not well rested right now, but I will be soon. Um, yeah. So there's a there's a gratefulness today and a sadness about tomorrow. I would say in terms of my specific experience with infertility. Yeah. And I thank you guys so much for sharing that and being so open and transparent. I, I love that we can be the kind of church that is willing to lean in and talk about loss and grief, to be open and transparent about what's going on in our life and, and, and really our feelings behind that. Because um, what, what you recognize is that although we go through a lot of little losses, what you guys are talking about are some of those critical, like uh, I guess what you consider kind of catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. Catastrophic loss is like where uh, your world is forever changed, like things are forever different, right? Um, that it's not like, oh, well, I guess I didn't get to go to that lunch date today. I mean, that whatever. You could pick up on that tomorrow. But these are things that really deeply impact us. They're, they come through ways of betrayal or a health crisis or, like you said, a death of a loved one or or sometimes, you know, um, e even even abuse, you know, that has somehow taken something from you, maybe taking your innocence or taking, you know, something. And so um, those are things that we absolutely feel. But I love that we get to talk about it because scriptures have a lot to say about grief and loss. Like scriptures don't shy away from grief and loss. They engage the grief and loss, right? And they give us ways that we can process. And one of those passages that are actually chapters, books that we can go to is uh, about a guy named Job. Anybody know about Job, Amen. right? Um, see, mo most people, most people want to stay away from Job. You know what I'm saying? Like they're like, they don't even like to talk about Job because they feel like Job's going to be contagious or something. It's going to like, it's going to, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to get on them. You know what I mean? It's like, so I don't, I don't want to talk about Job, but, uh, but today we're going to talk about Job. So I want you to hang in there with me. And, and we want to explain something fascinating about Job. If you're new in your faith and, and you don't know anything about Job or who we're talking about, Job is in the old Testament. Okay. If you're looking for Job, um, just simple rule of thumb, he's probably towards the middle of your Bible. He's right before Psalms. Okay. So you can kind of find him there. And scriptures give us some great detail about who Job is. And I want to read that. It's found in Job uh, chapter one, verses one through three. It says, in the land of Uz, I'm guessing that's what that is, or UZ. I, I don't know. We're from LA. So maybe he's from UZ. There lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and he had 500 donkeys and a large number of servants or a huge workforce. He says that he was the, the scriptures say he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. I mean, that's a pretty big introduction. I mean, that's Job chapter one, verses one through three, where like, hey, Ta-da, like here's Job. Ballin. Well, yeah, ballin, ballin, and not on a budget. You know what I'm saying? Like, like Job, Job is like legit. I mean, what scripture is telling us is you need to know about this guy, Job, because first of all, Job was wealthy. Job, Job had a lot. I mean, Job, he, he was kind of like our, our, you know, Forbes magazine, you know, front cover. Well, uh, maybe not so much. I mean, it's like, it's like Kanye West and then Job, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure, you know, right? Like, so, so Job, Job is, is, is right there, right? You know, and, and it says that Job has, he has 3000 camels, right? That, that'd be like, Hey, Job's got a whole fleet of Bentleys. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he's got, he's got, he's got the Rolls Royces on lock, like anything you want. Like he, he's, he's got it. But what I find fascinating is also saying he's a godly man. Yeah. Job, Job is godly, says that real clear descriptors of who he is. He's blameless. He's upright, it, that he feared God. In other words, he respects God. He honors God, right? He refuses or shunned evil that, that if people who knew Job, they would know something about Job. Not that he was just a, a wealthy business owner, right? But that he was a well-respected follower of God. That would have been clear. But then as you go on to read Job's life, and I'll give you a paraphrase, I encourage you to take some time to read the book of Job this week. But Job experiences what we would call sudden tragedy that uh, is really catastrophic loss, right? That we, we learn throughout scripture that in the course of one day, right? Job, he experiences enemy invasions, from all different directions where they take his stuff, like they, they, they plunder his animals. They, 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 they make away with, with everything that Job owns. All Job's buildings end up being destroyed. And then suddenly out of nowhere, there's a natural disaster that happens that destroys the home that his children are at. And all 10 of his kids are now lost, deceased in, in one day. It doesn't stop there. But Job, as he continues to experience the loss and grief that he's experiencing, suddenly Job becomes ill. 
Job's body starts to shut down. And, and we arrive at a certain point in the book of Job where Job in one day is not only reduced to nothing, but he finds himself literally sitting in the city dump, having nothing to his name, nowhere to go, picking the sores and scabs on his body, questioning God, God, where are you? Where have you been? What's going on? Now, when we talk about loss, right? Most of us, we experience loss kind of more slowly over our lifetime, right? It's not like, thank God, it's not like all in one day like that. But sometimes it feels like these tragic events have happened on a certain day that has changed the course of the direction of our life. That Job, he loses his material wealth for one, you know, that, that would be detrimental for a lot of us, but not just that, he loses his family. Ultimately, he loses his health. Now, now think about how hard that is, you know, Think about us trying to comprehend it. How would we process that, right? How would we go through that? I mean, we all know what suffering is, right? But, but, but what's so intense, about, intense to me about Job's suffering is Job's suffering is, is undeserved. In other words, like, I think some people have a view sometimes that, 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 oh, you do bad stuff and so bad stuff happens to you or you do good stuff and good stuff's supposed to happen to you, right? But the reality for Job is that there's no connection between doing wrong and pain and loss and grief. In other words, Job has done everything right up until this point. Job is reading his Bible. Job is going to church. Job, he loves God, but then suddenly out of nowhere, Job experiences immense loss and pain, and it has no correlation to how good or bad of a person that he is, which lets us know we all, no matter who we are, we're going to experience this in life. How you process it and how you acknowledge it, it matters, right? Job goes on in Job chapter one, verse 20 through 22. It says, at this, at, at understanding all that he had lost in that day, Job got up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, which is a sign of grief and mourning in biblical times, right? It says he fell to the ground, and this is what blows, blows me away. He fell to the ground and he worshiped. He fell to the ground and he worshiped, and this is what he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has now taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised, and in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with any wrongdoing. Mm. It sticks out crazy, like, like blatant to me that Job, he has a genuine sense that everything that he's always had never fully belonged to him anyway. Mm -hmm. It was as if he understood that everything he was given was entrusted to his care, right? That God gave him everything, that God deserved the glory for everything that he had, his wealth, his riches, his family, all of it, no matter what it was. And if those things were no longer in his, his grasp, if those things were no longer, you know, given to him, God still deserved praise. In the loss, in the pain, and the suffering, God still deserved glory because he had this, this sense that God was good, right? After all the funerals of his family, after trying to recoup all the loss, his marriage is ripped apart, and we find that everybody has different ways of grieving loss, mm -hmm. right? Because in Job chapter two, his wife, she's over it, right? She's sick of it. She, she can't take it no more, wow. right? I mean, she lost a lot. She lost, she lost a lot. Yeah. And here's what she says. She says, uh, he sa says in Job chapter uh, two, verse nine, it says, his wife says to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? You might as well curse God and die. I mean, think about that for a second. You might, you might as well just, just curse God and die. Again, everybody grieves differently. And I think for us, what our families taught us or maybe what our, our culture taught us or, or uh, they, they taught us acceptable ways of expressing or, or, or grieving or not expressing grief. I mean, it's different for everybody. I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, because I know we're all different backgrounds, right? It's what I, we love about City Line Church. We're a multi-ethnic church representative of this redeemed community. But all of us have learned different ways of grieving and handling the losses in our life. Um, what did that look like for you in your life? I mean, what, what kind of was role modeled for you or kind of taught to you? Um, uh, on, on how you handle grief? I mean, for, for good or bad. Maybe maybe there's some things that were really good and maybe some things that were really, really unhealthy. I could speak to it. Yes. Um, so I'm white. <laughs> very white. Like, very middle-class white Christian culture. That's my background. My parents are very um, affectionate. So I, was, I learned that I could talk about feelings pretty well and that that would be okay, probably to a certain extent, and that I was being too much drama, I'm sure. Um, you know. Um, but I have a, my husband's Mexican American. I have this memory of going to the first funeral with a family member of his that died and being struck by the wailing within the Catholic church that yeah. happened during the grief. Because for me, like funerals in, you know, in my culture, when I would go to funerals with mostly white people, um, we would be so silent. Stoic. At yeah. Stoic. And almost laughing, I would say, like almost like kind of 
a relief from the stoicism would be like inappropriately laughing or cracking mm-hmm. jokes. I don't know if that's cultural, but that's kind of my people, you know? Yeah. Caleb? Yeah. <laughs> I'm white also. How do you feel? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so there's a, I think there's a dynamic of, of that part. So it's not like we were just stoically sad, but the difference in that was pretty, yeah, for sure. was pretty big to me when the first time I went to that kind of funeral. Um, and it lent, it's like shocking, but it lends to the feelings that are inside coming. It's like an invitation yep. when people wail yep. to come out. I, Will's aunt, my husband's aunt's, sang a very sad song all together mm-hmm. and then cried like through the singing of the song. Yeah. And that was really significant, yeah. even though it was in Spanish and I don't speak Spanish. And c- so culturally there was, they, they, they were given a permission. To, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there was like a place for invitation, I think to feel it. Yeah. So it was, it was really good. But um, for my family, I think it's more kind of talking through the grief. Like yeah. when we're together, I've learned we talk constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so we talk through the feelings and kind of do it in a circular manner sure. so that we're processing. I would That's say it's part of our grief. So good. Troy, you mentioned something too about, um, it just struck me right now when we're talking about, um, Suzette said, obviously culture. Mm-hmm. Right? So culture, she gave two, two contrasts, right? Of like, you got Hispanic culture and you've got her, you know, Caucasian culture growing up. <laughs> white. You white. Yeah. <laughs> you, you also mentioned, um, culturally speaking, there were some significant ways that it was, you know, kind of, I guess role model to you. Yeah, I'm black. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we're gonna, you know, do that. No. Um, Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I, I was born and raised in. I was I was born and raised in church, but I was also born and raised in the hood uh, in in the '90s. Um, very significant subculture. Yes, very significant subculture. It was like the height of, of gangster rap, um, of which I am a little. A fan of a little bit, yeah. <laughs> just the, the music and stuff. But most white um, people too. <laughs> so, so culturally speaking, uh, as a black man, I was taught that it's okay to feel, but the only emotion that that is permissible to express is anger, mm-hmm. right? So when you lose something, like all the the feelings, like you just mask that with with being mad, yeah. right? Um, and also uh, trust no man, right? Like that was the mantra, like don't trust anybody. So, so I had to deal with like, I'm feeling something, I'm angry, I'm upset, but I can't bring this to anybody. A, cause I don't want to burden them or I don't want to place my trust in somebody that's going to then turn and, and see that as weakness and, and use it against me. Sure. Uh, and then in, in the church world that I grew up in, I grew up in a, in a Pentecostal church, um, which of which I still love. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was this idea of like, it was okay to be emotional and it was okay to bring your emotions to God. So long as those emotions were either God honoring or if you were in pain and you were hurting, you don't cross the line, right? Because like there's, as somewhere there's a line where you're going to offend God. Right. But, but my mom, like well, I remember asking her how to pray one time when I was just upset about something. She says, just talk to God. Just tell him whatever, like just whatever's on your heart. And so I'm trying to balance all these three perspectives. And honestly, the story of Job, it, it, it's huge because in Job um, chapter, what is it? Uh, 13 verse 15 Job says something that has resonated with me for forever he says though the Lord slay me yet will I trust him Mm -hmm. I will surely defend my ways to his face Mm -hmm. right so like the whole verse though the Lord slay me yet will I trust him I like I would hold on to that but then Job continues his like I'm I'm gonna talk to him about this to to his face like I'm gonna bring my concerns to him so he's saying like hey even if all this stuff is taken away I know that I can go to God. I know that I can bring it to God. And, and that's who I'm going to bring it to. I'm going to bring it to him. So Job wasn't worried about the line. Like he wasn't worried about overstepping his bounds and he didn't bottle it up and, and only keep it to himself. He says, yeah. no, I need to talk to God about this. Right. Um, and this is in response to his friends that gave him some less than desirable advice. He's like, all right, you guys shut up now. I'm going to talk to God about this yeah. because this is who I know God to be. And so I can trust him with everything that's going on in me and I can bring that to him. That's so good. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I know, so you you mentioned that you you had a, a, a kind of interesting experience on how to process that. I want to come back to that in just a second, but I, I think what we have to get at is like because we all have different ways of experiencing, expressing grief based on culture, based on a life experience, or maybe what our families role modeled for us. I, I think really we also have to hone in on the fact that the reality for us is most of us have never really learned a specific process for for how to to, to really go through grief, right? Or, or to experience loss. In other words, it, most of the time we've just, it's either figured out on your own mm-hmm. or unfortunately it's been a lot of stuffing or avoiding, right? Let's just, let's just avoid it, right? And so the danger is if we don't lean in and process the grief 
we end up building walls and barriers, mm -hmm. right? We, we build walls and barriers that create kind of these defenses that we try to keep the pain and the hurt out. Um, but the reality is, is that it, it still stays with us, but we don't get to full weight of our feeling. We don't get to experience the full weight of that because we, we spend so much time trying to avoid that. Um, their defense mechanism, I'm gonna give you just common ones. I'm just gonna work through them real quick. We're not gonna explain them in detail because I think they'll, they'll kind of explain themselves, but you know, often you see things like denial, right? Where we're gonna refuse to acknowledge what's really happening and what's going on. Uh, you're gonna see things like minimizing where uh, you can acknowledge what's going on, but you explain it as something that's really not that bad, you know? So you kind of minimize it, you know, especially in comparison to other people and what they're going through, you know, stuff like that. Um, there's things like blaming, right? Where we, we, we deny responsibility and we tend to want to project our hurt and pain or we want to project the fault on something or on someone else. That one's my favorite. That's your favorite, right? That's, <laughs> that's good. Blaming, really you're going to blame people. <laughs> um, there's distracting. Or uh, distracting is, uh, you know, you, you talk to people, you want to talk about their pain, they tend to want to change the subject or they want to the overuse of humor, mm -hmm. right? You know, to kind of just pretend like everything's all good mm -hmm. or um, we just stay really busy. Right. You know, we just, we just get real busy doing a lot of stuff and, and we keep ourselves busy because we're distracting ourselves. There's intellectualizing, right, where we try to analyze everything or theorize everything is how it to happen and how it's been, and, you know, just to avoid actually feeling it. Because if we can get a, 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 a theoretical understanding of it, then then we feel better about it. Right. And then there's hostility. Right. Which Troy talks about where you just get, you get angry, you get irritable. Right. Uh, you, you don't you don't even want to hear like, hey, someone hurt you and somebody brings up their name. You're like, hey. We're not going to talk about them today, right? Like we're not going to, you know, just because that's the way that we've learned how to process. Can I say something? You can say something. Okay. <laughs> um, I notice, I didn't notice it before. Please forgive me. But I notice on this list how many of these things are, maybe not denial, how many of these things could be healthy, but they're kind of overcorrections. So yes. hostility, healthy anger, that's amazing, right? Blaming. Finding responsibility, that's amazing. So like there's ways where this is oh, distracting, could be like a comfort in a way mm -hmm. until you're ready to deal with it. Could be denial for a little bit. And then, so there's so many ways where these are um, good, but over corrections when we're yeah. dealing with grief. So Thank good. you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. And so, so like I said, um, they're good, but they're over corrections, right? And, and here's kind of what we want you to understand is like, it, God is inviting us to be in touch with our feelings, not to be defensive towards them or to deny them, right? That I would go as far as to say it's unbiblical to not be in touch with your feelings, right? Of loss, of sadness, of anger, of frustration. In doing so, you're kind of attempting to be inhumane, you know, like non-human, right? Because God has created you with those feelings. He's given you to, for a reason and a purpose. He wants you to experience those. But when we don't process those things before God, the, the very feelings that make us human, like sadness and, and, and like fear, fear. And, and eventually we find those things leaking into other areas of our life, mm -hmm. right? I think even if you look in church culture, right? You look in, in the local church, churches are filled with, with leaking Jesus followers, right? You know, who, who have, who have not treated their emotions or their feelings um, as a discipleship issue, mm -hmm. right? Who, who have not chosen to lean into that when God is actually in, inviting us to actually turn towards the pain, to lean into the pain. It's so counterintuitive to us, but Solomon, right? One of the wisest of all time, the book of Ecclesiastes, he says something profound. He says in Ecclesiastes verse one, and then again in verse four, he says, there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. What does that mean? Well, there's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn, but there's a time to dance. In other words, he's saying you're going to go through life and there's going to be seasons where all this is significant and all this matters and you can't skip them. You can't go around them. You can't avoid them. You have to choose to lean into them. And he gives us a choice. He says the choice is whether or not our losses are going to continually take from us or they're going to open us up to the new possibilities of transformation in Christ, right? Jesus invites us to transformation, right? To a restorative work in our life. For, for, for the rest of our time together, I, I want us to talk about um, not just processing our losses, because I mean, there's so much that we can say and we only have so much time. So maybe we're gonna have to do the extended cut, you know, like at some point um, for everybody. But I do wanna talk about not just how do you process loss, but how do you do it from, um, how do you do it biblically? Uh, how do you process loss biblically? And I think Job models how we grieve in, in the family of Jesus, right? We see him kind of go through a process of, of grieving. We're gonna take you through four phases, really, uh, of, of grieving with God. And as we do that, like I said, I, mean, I know, so you, you talked about your family, you know, had a pretty interesting way of like learning how to grieve that I, I would say is probably a really good process. I mean, what, what share, share a little bit more about 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, just to touch up on that, um, I'm kind of in between white and black, so I'm like a brownish tone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Filipino, but <laughs> um, one way that we kind of process uh, when dealing with grief and loss is um, we would kind of I internalize things and, and really wouldn't express our emotions. So I found one thing that was helpful for us to kind of break that cycle. Um, what we decided to do, this real practical step, um, uh, after we lost our mom is that we decided to get together, um, our immediate family, me and my brother, my, uh, my brothers, my sister, my dad, and anyone else I want to come, um, we get together two or three times a month, a few times a month, just to have like uh, these real raw sessions about how we were feeling, uh, what we were going through. And these are raw sessions, like anger, frustration, um, not just uh, about the situation, but you know, towards God sometimes, mm -hmm. um, which is a natural and, and uh, kind of response to, to some of that catastrophic that has happened. Um, you can even look at Job worship after, you know, this happened to him, but you look at chapter three, it's probably one of the darkest chapters yep. in, in, in the whole yep. Bible. It's just that he, he just goes off on this rant, but yeah, that's what these sessions were. They were just kind of, um, a way for us to intentionally get together, discuss how we were feeling and just lay it all on the line and just kind of air it out and let it out. Um, and I think, um, one thing that I've learned from that is that we've talked about how everyone mourns and, and grieves differently and, and alone in, in some sense, but healing happens in community mm -hmm. um and so that's what's important we see that um job's friends um in in the early chapters they had good intentions this is they they agreed to get together um to comfort him and to sympathize with him um and they sat with him in silence for a few days um we see like as it played out they should have just stayed silent yeah. <laughs> yeah, right they had the best intentions right. advice for most christians yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah the best intentions and uh, kind of that's what this was it was just uh, kind of like a community and uh, of getting together i learned that through city line you know um we had just started coming to this church and this happened and there's people that here on staff people here that were praying for me that were praying for our family that sat in the icu and the er with my mom and me and and so that was very helpful so just the the importance of community and knowing that you're not walking through it alone there's people yeah. that have gone through these things and that genuinely care for you and genuinely are praying for you um that are going to help you through this That's so good yeah I, I wanted you to share that because i think that first phase in going through this idea of grieving with God really centers around paying attention to your losses. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it sounds like that's what you and your family decided to do was uh, we're going to sit in this and we're going to pay attention to it, which is hard sometimes because let's just be real. Um, sometimes as people or even sometimes within the, the church global, we, we typically um, have little theology around anger, around sadness, around around waiting, or around depression, around, around things that we're struggling with. Um, we, we tend to ask people, how are you, right? And they, and they give you that real quick answer. Oh, couldn't be better, praise Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Or like, you know, uh, are you sure everything's okay? Yeah, God's working all things out for the good of those who love him. You know what I'm saying? And I, I just don't know what it's gonna look like. And so they, they wanna kind of band-aid it because here's what the back end of that is. Sometimes theologically, we've said, you're supposed to experience joy. You're supposed mm -hmm. to experience peace. You're supposed to have this. So now I carry feelings of guilt and shame that I feel so down, that I feel so overwhelmed with grief, that I feel so like I'm sitting in this, this pain. And so what I'd rather do is I'd rather give a surface level interaction rather than, than face the hard things because I, 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 yep. you know, I don't, I don't want to feel that guilt. But what I love about Job, what Soy had mentioned too, it's like, I would say not just chapter three, but for 35 chapters, <laughs> right? Th if you read it, 35 chapters, He's struggling with God. He's doubting God. He's weeping. He's wondering where the heck God is. He doesn't avoid it, right? He screams out in his pain, right? He, he's not holding anything back. He's shouting at God. He's praying these wild prayers, right? You know, like it's like, you know, he's just telling God exactly what he's feeling. He even gets to the point where he literally curses the day that he was born. He was like, it was, it's just, it would just be better at this point that, that I would just never born, which is, I mean, that's talk about intense grief. And loss, right? But but this is a story of a guy doing life. Listen, with God, there's a, there's a witness yep. that community, not just with God, but like yeah, his friends do show up, and, and there is a time where they they're they're, they're just quiet, they're just there with him. And, and this is what we see: we have a witness with God, we have a witness with community, and you see this is a biblical practice you see it in genesis that god grieved you see it again that david grieved you see it that jonathan grieved you see that two-thirds of the psalms are all about grief all about lament all about complaining towards god jeremiah he wrote a whole book called lamentations you know like where I, i'm going to be lamenting to god about all these things that are going on and i know suzette you've done some pretty extensive work on lamenting and, and i'd love for you to kind of just share a, a couple thoughts on that but then i'd love to kind of just hear like what is your guys's experience with lamenting like do you lament? Like, can, can you talk to God in that way? Does it feel awkward? 
you know, because of our upbringing or our church background or our to, to speak to God in that way. It's certainly a transition, right? But it's mm-hmm. like what we're talking about today is doing acknowledging loss and thinking through grief and feeling those feelings with God is basically what yep. lament means. Mm-hmm. You know, it does it's not anything uh, more complicated than that except that we train ourselves out of it, I think, and think that it's less holy. Um and what and soy with your family and that story and I think you said it in here but at least we talked about it this week or last week where you said it was really messy and raw sometimes and really rough and that roughness that messiness is an important part of lament because as feelings come up inside of us we need to let them out and not hold them or like you said they leak out yeah. somewhere else you yeah, know that's great. um and when I think of the verse that Troy brought up um and the verse about that I can't quote right now, but the verse about his wife saying, curse God and die. Notice the difference between cursing God and what Job then did for 35 chapters, yes. which was messy and raw and rough and continued to defend himself. That's the word you use, right? I defend myself to you. I'm crying out for justice to you. And I'm doing it over and over and over until you listen to me like the angry judge in the gospels mm-hmm. where the woman goes and goes and goes and the angry judge at some point goes, okay, fine, just get out of my face. I'm tired yeah. of hearing from you. You have your, you have your need granted. Here's justice for you. Um, and so much more does our father in heaven, who's our creator and created us want to hear from us and wants to bring justice for us. You know, um, that's it. So good. There's more. That's okay. Good. No, tell that's me. That's good. That's well, good. Yeah. Caleb, uh, tell me your experience with lament. Oof. Um, <laughs> oof. <clears throat> so me, it, it's been a learning process, which I think all of us have been. Um, I remember when I was out of college, I went to therapy because I had some things to work through and Ow. we always will. Yeah. Um, yeah, and sure. I was sitting in the counseling room, sitting on the couch, like a normal therapist room. <laughs> and my therapist was explaining that I am a phenomenal stuffer. Um, and just push everything down and don't really address it. Um, And then she used this analogy of a healthy volcano, um, which is weird, but it's really helpful for me because I'm a visual person. Um, She said healthy volcanoes um, are those who slowly let out the lava inside them, Um, things that are heavy and hurtful, um, but slowly expressed. And you can find those in like Hawaii and other places around the world. Um, but unhealthy volcanoes are those who let the, the lava build up so much that then ex- eventually they just explode and they hurt people around them. Um, and it's catastrophic and it's painful. Um, and she said, for me to be a healthy volcano, I need to slowly express what I'm feeling, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, um, so that I don't let it build up and then hurt those around me. Um, and so for me, that changed my mentality of understanding, like, one, when I stuff, it's going to come out eventually. Um, it's going to be there. And that's, that's, it's happening no matter what. Um, but when I understand that it's there and I need to express it and let it out, um, that's when I'm healthier. That's when I'm a better person. That's when I, I can help others better um, and, and walk with them and bring them into what I was going through. Uh, real quick, when my dad passed away last year, um, Troy actually came up to me and said, hey, do not do what you usually do. Do not stuff it. It's not going to be good. Let it out slowly. Let us in. Let us come alongside you. And that's what the goal is, is to let people into what you're going through and express how heavy things are, and that's okay. Whether it's small or big, it's slowly letting it out. Yeah. That's what community is for. So good. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, you, you kind of, even in that analogy, begin to hit on the next piece that we want to leave people with as well is like, Hey, the next step to processing this with God is to stay patient in the confusing in between, right? There's a lot of confusing in between of like, Hey, loss has happened. We're processing this. How long is this process going to be? How long do we got to go through this pain? How long until we're feeling healed and whole again? And again, much like last week, the question, the answer to that question is we don't know. We don't know, but we know that we can trust God to be at work, that God is active in doing something. Um, and again, you know, a Job, we see his friends show up, they're with him, but it wasn't before too long that his, his friends got anxious in the patients, right? They, 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 they couldn't stand waiting and they needed to figure out an explanation for what was happening. And their explanation looked a lot like, 
Um, sometimes what we see, unfortunately, um, be an unhealthy view or unhealthy theology of loss and grief is that for them, they were connecting Job's losses to being adamant that Job must have sinned somehow, that Job must have done something wrong against God. And so now this was the wrath of God being poured out on Job, when in the reality we know in Job's story, Job did nothing wrong. Job was a righteous, upstanding man, and he was still experiencing loss. But his friends just wanted to explain it away with kind of the classic religion or classic legalistic approach that sometimes we find often it, it is really not helpful. Like like Soy said, they should have just stayed quiet. You know, it, it would have been a lot better just to them just sit with them in that moment. And in that moment, you can embrace God. In that moment, you begin to grieve, right? Grieving gives us a space to ask God, where, where are you, God? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'm going to sit in here and continue to track with you mm -hmm. in this process and, and walk with you in this, which also brings us to a point of like, we're embracing our limitations, mm -hmm. right? That we know that we can't fix it. We can't change it. We can't make it happen faster. Doesn't matter how much money we had. Doesn't matter your retirement. Doesn't matter like all this stuff that you think that you need to make yourself feel like, okay, I'm secure, I'm stable, I'm this and that, that we all have limitations. We have limitations around our, our, our life. We have limitations around our time. We have limitations around all that we can say today <laughs> in the limited amount of time that we have for this online, you know, <laughs> broadcast. I mean, we, we've, got, we've got limitations and there's nothing that we can really do about that other than being willing to simply embrace those limits, being willing to sit in that confusing in between, al alone with God, sometimes in community with others, but also allowing others the opportunity to know, give them permission. You don't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. Just be with me. You know what I'm saying? You, 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 I, I, don't, I don't need a word from God from you right now. I've been connecting and praying with God myself. I, I just need you to be, and we're gonna sit in the confusing in between. We're gonna embrace the limits. And, and there's a part of us that hates that, right? Like we do, they, they just, it just makes us so frustrated. Like, I don't want to embrace my limits because we, again, we love control. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is a part of us surrendering to God, right? And when we surrender to God, here, here's the beautiful thing, right? We allow the old to begin to birth the new, mm -hmm. right? We allow the old to begin to birth the new. Um, yeah, the thing about grief and loss is there's a finality to it. Like it's, it's finalizing something. Like we can't get that thing back. But, but good grieving is not just being willing to let go but it's allowing that grief to bless us, right? It's allowing God to, to do a work in our life. And, and the danger, if we're not willing to let go and let God do that, we can get stuck. I mean, we talked about that, right? You know, that um, you, you hold on to a dream or you hold on to a past hurt or you hold on to something that happened and you're not able to grieve it and process it, you get stuck. To Caleb's volcano, you know, uh, uh, illustration, you know, um, Suzette, you brought up, you know, kind of like this Pompeii where you're like frozen in time, you know, where you're kind of just like stuck in time, which, you know, easily led to a conversation about um, Napoleon Dynamite and Uncle Rico, right? You know, where it's like, you know, Uncle Rico, he, he's not letting the football dream go, right? You know, it's like he just got to keep recording it just to make his keep, throw more perfect. Yeah, it's going to happen, you know, but what he does is, is that, that, that I feel particular movie is a great example of being stuck in time. Yeah right very stuck in a certain thing that you you just won't let go and you can't move forward and so um yeah god, god is a god who restores i mean uh, i know we only got just a, a really slender time small time left but um like i said wh what are you learning or what have you learned as you're, you're processing grief anybody just want to share yeah i think for me um to to go through it Right, like as we've been talking to and trust God. Um, otherwise, I run the risk of viewing the world through my grief-colored glasses, right? And and I begin to that loss and that pain begins to color all of my relationships and interactions with other people. And so now I'm holding new people in my life and the new things in my life accountable to what someone else did or what else happened. And I can't fully enjoy it. Like yeah. I can't fully enjoy it. What what I have learned is that um, after losing my mother, right, like my life is actually headed in a better direction. Not because she's not here, but because I allowed god and people to be with me in that and to move forward and and what i've also learned is the five-year plan that i had it pales in comparison to the plan that god had yeah now i had to sacrifice a lot i had to give up a lot in order to get it and there's still moments where i'm like man like i wonder what life would have been like without that but being able to go through that and grieve and be raw and real like like i've i'm learning and i've learned to just keep it a buck with god like keep it 100 like yep i'm, I'm just gonna be real with you uh, talk about what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what's going on, what I'm frustrated about, because I trust you with all of my heart, 
right? Like you can handle it. You're big enough and you care. Like you love me. And like, as, as God mentions to Job, like you have no idea how big I am, right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. like God's huge. And so to, to know that that's who I'm engaging with and that's who's in my corner at the end of the day is, is helpful. Doesn't fix everything in the traditional sense, but it does open up the possibility of, of like living with peace and trust and having better relationships and better health and yeah. growing, growing through it's it. That's so good. No, I appreciate that. And I think we can't, um, fail to understand that like loss is actually central to the gospel message, right? At the end of the day, right? We understand the gospel message is there is death, right? There is burial, mm -hmm. there is resurrection or there's transformation. And that same happens in our life. I mean, Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 24, I tell you the truth that unless a kernel of the wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. It's just a single seed. But it's death, right? Being planted in the ground will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And, and what, and what I, I love uh, about that is, is that's the central message of Christ, that suffering and death, uh, us dying to ourselves, us being willing to die to those dreams, us being willing to let those things go. Um, you know, it, it, those things can be restored and renewed into new and greater things when we allow God to do a significant work in our heart as we go through the process. So at the end of the day, when it comes down to loss and grief is that we understand that loss, it marks the place where self-knowledge and powerful transformation can happen if, if we actually have the courage to participate fully in the process, fully in the process. And so today, um, as we kind of wrap our time together today, here, here's what I want you to know. We want to spend a few moments just praying over you um, today. Um, we're also going to this week give you an opportunity to take some next steps in grieving. Not only are these steps going to be helpful to you because they're biblical ways that we can grieve with God, but also Suzette has put together a lament inventory um, that we're going to walk you through. It'll be available for you online. It'll be available on social media. And we'd love for you to take that and utilize that, either you individually or together with some friends as you continue to walk and process through acknowledging the loss that exists in your life and choosing to lean into the grief and trust God that he's going to do a transformative work in your heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for our time together. God, I thank you, Lord, that we can get together and talk about hard and difficult things that we're all struggling with. And God, you meet us there. That's your promise, that you meet us, Lord, in our loss. You meet us in our pain. You meet us in our hurt, Lord God. You are there. And so, Father, I pray, God, for everyone listening today, God, that as they begin to process the grief, Lord, as they begin to process through the loss, Lord, that they would find your hand mighty and strong in their life, that they would experience your peace like never before. They would experience your comfort, God, that you would do a great work in them, God, as you continue to stir in their heart, Lord God, all that you have for them. Lord, I pray, God, that in the overwhelming feelings that we experience, God, that we would find you, Jesus, Lord God, walking alongside us, Lord God, choosing, Lord God, to take us by the hand, Lord, and lead us through. And Father, I pray that we would be faithful to trust in you, Lord, that we would see that the things that we've lost, Lord, the things that we're grieving, God, Lord, that although there's an end to those things, you still have much more ahead of us. So Father, I pray, God, that we would faithfully pursue that as we trust in you. So Father, we leave all of our grief and loss in your hands and we thank you that we can process it with you. In Jesus' name.
Take a
perfect jars of clay that have chips and cracks and missing pieces. We were whole when we first came into this world because you made us whole from the beginning and then we were separate from you and all of this brokenness happened because we're in this broken world and because we're not perfect we can't be not here but God through all of the heartbreak through all of the brokenness and the grief, the loss, some of our own making, God. You see the beautiful potential. You see the masterpiece that we're intended to be, and that's what you love. Whether we ever fix it or allow you to fix it, truly, whether we ever allow you to fix it or not, that's how you see us, is that whole beautiful vessel as you intended us. God, I pray that we allow you to do the work of knitting our pieces back together. There's so much more than we could ever imagine in this life with you. With you knit together our broken pieces, restore these broken vessels. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your grand plan, your artwork, your masterpiece, cracks and broken pieces and all. In your precious and matchless name, we say thank you and pray, amen. Well, we sincerely hope that you enjoyed your time with us today. If you'd like to stay connected and hear more about what's going on here at CityLine Church, we encourage you to check out our website at citylineonline.org. And also, don't forget to follow us on all your favorite social media channels. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.